Welcome to the Robert Wenzel Show. Please stand by for Robert Wenzel. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Robert Wenzel Show. I'm Robert Wenzel. My guest today is Neil Borofsky, former Special Inspector General in charge of oversight of TARP. He is currently a senior fellow at the New York University School of Law. From December 2008 to 2011, he was the Special Inspector General, as I noted. Before that, he was a federal prosecutor in the United States Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York. Among the significant cases he brought was one against the former CEO and president of REFCO and leading the investigation that resulted in the indictment of the top 50 leaders of the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Columbia. Neil, welcome to the show. Uh, Thank you for having me. I sort of get a sense that in certain ways what you've done when you were at the U.S. Attorney's Office and what you did at at top sort of tie-in. My first question to you is, do you consider yourself more of a free market person or a central planner? I don't know if I really think of myself in either one of those terms. Um, You know, I do believe in the fundamentally in capitalism. And, you know, when I saw when I got down to Washington was what we've done with our largest financial institutions, the biggest banks, um, doesn't really resemble capitalism in a lot of ways. It, it's really about enormous government subsidies that go to these handful of financial institutions uh, through bailouts and through the implicit guarantee that comes with those bailouts um, that gives them an unfair advantage on the rest of the market. And, and the normal ideas of capitalism, things like um, you know being able to fail, um, have sort of disappeared. And, and what we have now is this very inefficient um, megapolis banks um, that are that you know help contribute to the last financial crisis, and what we did in response was essentially to make them bigger. They still enjoy those subsidies, um, and it creates a real danger uh, for another financial crisis in the near future. So, I mean, I think with, with respect to that, I'm more free market than central planning. In my reading of the book, I didn't get the sense that you were anti-TARP more than the way TARP was handled. So, are you now moving more towards a sense that TARP itself was bad or, or just the handling of TARP? It's really the handling of TARP. I mean, the fact that we needed to have a TARP, that there was a need to bail out the banks, you know, represents a failure of our financial system. Um, you know, I believe that, that the banks had gotten so big um, and were so interconnected and that if they had, if they had failed in 2008, if they had been allowed to fail, there's a real risk they would have brought the entire economy down with them. Um, that probably made the need to bail them out in some form um, a necessary evil. I think where where I have an objection is the manner in which they were bailed out, um, and, and that I mean that essentially instead of breaking them up or punishing them for their terrible management decisions, for the incredible risks they, that they took, instead of penalizing the executives who were in charge, who who enjoyed rapacious profits and bonuses going into the crisis because of these bad bets, because of the government guarantee, we put a giant band-aid over everything and essentially pretended that it, we were better off because we had some degree of stability um, without recognizing that, that we're, we're really just sowing the seeds for, for, for a future crisis. And, you know, when I got to Washington and started seeing what was going on, um, you know, within the administrations, it was really somewhat disturbing and somewhat shocking to see how much influence these banks had over the terms of their own bailout. So, so I, I, you know, bailout was some form of rescue was probably necessary back in 2008. The way we did it, which was just essentially to enrich a handful of executives and, and preserve the power of these institutions, and in many ways make them even bigger and more powerful than they were before the crisis, was a very flawed approach. Yeah. Uh, Neil, how much money do you think was, was, was spent on the um, bailouts? What number do you have on that right now? Well, I mean, all told, um, of money that went out the door, and you know, a lot of it came back, um, was certainly in the trillions. I mean, in, in TARP, it was about $475 billion just in that one program. But when you look at, at the other programs, the other remarkable efforts by, by the Federal Reserve, by the FDIC, um, you know, you're approaching $5 trillion of, of total support to the financial institutions. And on top of that, you had sort of commitments and promises that ultimately, fortunately, went unfulfilled that went into the tens of trillions of dollars. Let's just go anywhere from the $475 billion to... Five trillion. Where did that money come from? 
you know, a lot of it was, was um, to use the colloquial language, printed. Um, it's more created electronically uh, by the Federal Reserve. You know, I could stuck at that point. So you're in favor of bailing out banks with money that's printed, which means it's money that's not that, that banks have available to use in competing against everybody else that has money. I mean, if money's going to them, the money supply is increasing in their favor. So I, let, let me be very clear. I, I'm not in favor of bailing out the banks by printing money. I, I, I think that you know, too big to fail is a tautology, and we have to stop too big to fail. We have to end too big to fail um, so that we never are in a position where the failure of one bank or a handful of banks could bring down our entire financial system again. Um, you know, that's, you know, that's where we were in 2008 and whether they needed to get bailed out or didn't need to get bailed out. The bottom line is that there, you know, there was a consensus in Washington that they needed to get bailed out. And that's why you saw all that extraordinary effort. And what I'm telling you is that if we don't fix this system, if we don't fix the problems we have in the system, this will happen again. Yeah, Neil, if this effort of printing money, which I can spend, I mean, I can push a button to get money printing all day long. So, I mean, we, we can't look at it from that direction. So, were you in favor of the printing of money to provide funds for TARP for the various bailout programs? Well, again, TARP wasn't funded by printing of money. TARP was funded by... It was. I asked you where the money came from. And I started telling you one of the areas where the money came from, which was through the Federal Reserve programs were essentially done through that. TARP was done by borrowing it by raising taxpayer funds. Um, FDIC raised money by charging a fee to the banks. I mean, there are different ways in which money was raised for the bailouts. And, and to be very clear, I'm not pro bailout. In fact, the reason I, the re, part of the reason why I wrote this book was so we can be in a position where we're not having to bail out these banks again. Um, and that, that, that requires a recognition that what we did was broken. We had a broken financial system and we didn't fix the financial system. Well, well, and the important thing in the future is to do the necessary things so we're never in a position where we need to bail out the banks again. What do you think caused the crisis? I mean, that's a, that's a long question. Uh, there are a number of things that caused the crisis. You, you, you just said that the banks being too large was part of the problem. And that we Absolutely. Made problem. Are you saying banks being too large caused the crisis or are you misdirecting us a little bit there? No, I'm not misdirecting you. There is a number of different causes of the financial crisis. One of, one of the accelerants of the financial crisis, for sure, was the size of the banks. When you have banks that are, that are this big, that benefit from the implicit government guarantee, that gives them incentives to pile on risk, to, to take, take risks that they otherwise wouldn't. So just to give you, you know, just, just, to, just to spell it out, you know, when you go to a bank and you deposit your money in the bank, right, you... You go in, and most people who do so, they look, they see that their deposits are insured by the FDIC, um, and they know that if they have up to $250,000 for an individual or $500,000 for a couple, that they don't really need to worry about whether the bank is solvent, whether it's taking big risks, whether it's having, taking big, making um, unwise decisions, whether it's borrowed too much, too much leverage. Um, and that's, the, you know, that's what comes from deposit insurance. For the big banks um, leading up to the crisis, they had that same sense of security, not from an explicit government program from deposit insurance, but from, from the implicit guarantee, the presumption that the government would bail them out. And that led to very, very risky decisions. There was not the normal functions of the market of market discipline, which would have cut them off. They wouldn't have been able to borrow as much money as they did. Their counterparties would, wouldn't engage in business what they did. Um, and that creates huge, huge incentives to, to pile on risk. And what you saw was, as a result of that, and directly related to that, was the explosion of, um, you know, of very risky mortgages, the throwing out of underwriting standards, looking the other way for fraud, as all this risk piled up in our housing market, which helped cause an enormous bubble, um, which was, you know, which was fueled by a lot of things. But one of the primary ones was the the lender's responsibility of of having real underwriting standards. And when that those went out the door. Um, and responsibility of holding mortgages as opposed to selling them off and slicing and dicing them through ever ever more complex financial instruments, um, you had a very great concentration of risk in a, in a small handful of institutions. And that eventually led to a bubble that burst um, that caused huge amounts of losses. And because the banks didn't have enough capital, because they, didn't, uh, because they had borrowed so much money, um, they had to go you know, hat in hand to the, the federal government. To, to rescue them because they were essentially on the risk of being insolvent. I don't have uh, much of a dispute with you with regard to you know, the, the structure of the banking system and where moral hazard is, 
you know, right. I mean, you asked me what I thought the crisis caused, and that that you know that that's hard to do in thirty yeah, seconds. I would argue more that the Federal Reserve was the key because if the money wasn't there, the banks couldn't leverage up the way they are. I mean, that's so I think there's a strong argument that that very low interest rates. Um, which were maintained by the Federal Reserve, helped fuel the bubble, helped stimulate demand for housing, um, and helped and it helped inflate the bubble. I don't disagree with you there. I also think the Federal Reserve had a real role and obligation um, when it came to to looking at predatory lending and some of these horrific practices um, that were done on some of the arms of the bank holding companies, some of their non-bank arms that were involved in the mortgage origination that were doing these abuses. So I, I don't disagree with you at all that that all is part of of what led to a crisis, but ultimately, you know, those things trace back to these, you know, largely to these large financial institutions. Seeing that, I think we both can agree that the last thing that either one of us ever want is for taxpayer money, whether it's or printed money, to ever have to be used to bail out these banks again. Right. But the point you're really getting at is that there was a power center in Washington. We agree with that. We agree with that. That there is a that that the, the power and influence of, of of a handful of Wall Street institutions has has hijacked American policy, economic policy, in a lot of different aspects. Yeah, it's, and rather it's, than the pharmaceutical the, industry has hijacked FDA and, and so on and so forth, it goes down the road. So my question is, maybe what we should be doing, and I'm asking you if, if, if you go along with this, is we should be eliminating the power centers that the power people can go after. I mean, your book is all about the fact that the power center won, that you went in there and you were going to do this and do that, and... and Geithner ignored you. I mean, that's the basic theme of your book. Why have the power center in the first place? The money came from somewhere. You, you either tell me it was printed, which means there's more money going to those people. You know, there, there, are, there, are, two, there are two parts to this problem. Um, there was the corrupting influence of the giant banks, and there was those who were, who were corrupted in Washington. And to address this problem, I think you, I, you have to address both problems. So on the one hand, um, I think we have to deal with the corrupting influence, which is the power and money that comes with the giant financial institutions, and I think they need to be broken up. I don't think I think that's the best way to deal with that government subsidy is to make it so they no longer enjoy an advantage because of their their special status is too big to fail. But I also I, but I totally agree with you. On the other hand, we need to do something about Washington, and we need to deal with the revolving door between Wall Street and Washington, um, and we need to change the way our regulators approach their jobs. We need to re-educate them. They have to be advocating for people, not for not for corporate, not for the company. I disagree with you. If there's a power center, someone is going to figure out a way to fill it, okay? Whether it's the big banks, you can break up the big banks, it will happen some other way. If there's a power center where things can be directed in a certain way, where a lot of money can be made, the power center will be influenced in some way. It's the same thing. I mean, in your blurb here on your book, you talk about breaking up the uh, revolutionary armed forces of Colombia, who were apparently a, a major cocaine distributor. Is that correct? Yes, they're the world's I mean, biggest cocaine manufacturer. So, Neil, my point is, do you think it would be difficult to walk on the street in New York or Chicago or Los Angeles and find coke if you want? You didn't change anything, okay? All you did was change the players. As long as you have power centers, what you're doing is you're creating power people. And that's what you did when you went after FARC, okay? If, in my view... I think cocaine should be legalized so you can walk into a store, like a convenience store, and the way you can buy cigarettes, you can buy cocaine. Then, then what happens is you completely eliminate all these shootings, all these killings, because law-abiding citizens would be willing to provide the product. You're not eliminating the product. What you're doing is you're getting the worst of the worst into the business. When you were with the uh, Southern District of uh, New York, you're two guys with guns battling each other. Whoever wins that particular battle is not going to change the fact that cocaine is going to be on the street. It's only going to make it a more deadly game. It's the power centers that are the problem. I, I don't understand how you guys don't see that. So, so what is your solution, that we get rid of the United States Treasury Department? I would go along with that, absolutely. What do we need those guys for? They won't even let us see the gold they supposedly hold for us in Fort Knox. You can go down to the Federal Reserve Bank in New York and you can see the gold held for Germany, Spain, China, every other country in the world, yet no one in the world is allowed to see the United States gold. That should tell you something right there about what goes on at the Treasury. It's a power center and there's no good that comes out of it. As your book points out, in the tiny microscopic world that you looked at TARP, they didn't pay attention to you.
they did whatever the hell they wanted for the benefit of whoever the hell they wanted. And that's what a power center is about. The guys that control the power centers are really bad guys. I don't see how you don't understand that. It's, I, I fundamentally understand that we have a problem with our system. I think we disagree about what measures we need to take to get to that solution. Though I think we, we have you know, some area of, of agreement on where the problem lies uh, and what the problem is. Um, and uh, you know, that's the great thing is we all, we all get to have different opinions. Yeah, but Neil, let's go back to the cocaine thing. I mean, do you think you have stopped cocaine from being sold on the streets in New York by, by prosecuting 50 guys? It's Robert, this is, you know, we have about 20 minutes for this, and I think we're running out of time. And I, you know, maybe on another occasion, we, we, yeah, we maybe on another occasion, quiet. we could talk about the, maybe on another occasion, we could talk about the war on drugs, which is, again, a very. Being sold on the streets of New York by going after FARC. I really understand your point, but much like your other question to me of what caused the financial crisis, um, it's not something I can give you an answer for in a, in a 15 second sound bit, um, and perhaps we can talk about it another time, but um, as you mentioned at the beginning of this call, I've got a lot of stuff on my plate, and um, I do need to go on to, to the next appointment. Um, but I thank you very much for your time, and uh, as I said, um, you know, it was, it was a... It was, it was certainly interesting hearing your, so your point of view. We don't have um, problems with power centers, though, that, that can be influenced by outside people and create problems like you pointed out at TARP. I think that's a, a pretty remarkably simplistic description of what I've said today. I don't think I've... I, don't, I, don't, I think the last thing that one can say, that you could say from hearing what I've said today and what I've wrote in my book is that I'm a, a fan of unbridled power for certain institutions without checks. Um, I think I pretty clearly have said the exact opposite. Anyhow, thank you very much. But I, you know, I, I, I did agree to do this, but we also agreed to a time limit, and I do have to go. Okay, Neil. I wasn't aware of a time limit, but um, we can. Well, end of course, it there's a time limit. When you when you talk to them, we're, we're, this is going to be a four-hour interview. Uh, there was, we had a, we had an agreement for a 20-minute time limit. We spent now more time discussing how long the interview is than answering a further question. So I don't think that's true. I think we spent, 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 I think we spent 20 minutes. another power center. I think we spent 20 minutes discussing the issues, and then the last three minutes, because I have to go to another appointment, because you didn't, you didn't agree to, to honor our, our time commitment. Look, I, I'm very patient to answer your questions, but I really do have to go. So, so thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Neil. Well, I guess that's the end of this show with 19 minutes. By the way, executive producer Chris Rossini has informed me that Borofsky originally agreed to 30 minutes, not 20 minutes. It's in the email, and we've got a copy of that if Neil would ever like to, to see it if he lost his copy. But the bottom line is these guys do not like to be questioned about the fact that power centers will always be influenced by power people. They all like to play the game that will create these regulations, will create all these battles, and, and solve all kinds of things. That's not the case. When he was a United States attorney in the Southern District of New York, he um, has on his biography his great battle with FARC where 50 people were arrested. Yet it is clear that with these 50 arrested he made of FARC, drug dealers has done nothing as far as eliminate drugs on the streets of New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, or any other city in the United States. It's all phony stuff. It doesn't work. Regulations don't work. They create power centers. If the Southern District of New York is going to knock out FARC, somebody else is going to come in to take that spot. If cocaine was legal, you'd be able to go in and buy it in a drugstore much cheaper. Nobody would steal for it. There would be no shooting. There would be no gang wars over it or anything else. It would just be like cigarettes. You shouldn't smoke cigarettes. You shouldn't take cocaine. But that's another situation. It has nothing to do with regulations which cause the gang wars and the battles but do nothing to eliminate the product. And as far as TARP, his book is good because it's a warning about how power centers just don't care what other people think. Uh, Borofsky was in there uh, attempting to bring transparency and do various things within TARP. Geithner basically ignored him. That's what his book is about. As far as TARP itself, uh, Borofsky seemed to at one point say that it was money printing is where the money came from for TARP. At other points, he said it was borrowed. At other points, he said it was taxed. But the point is, wherever it came from, what it means is that's money, four to five hundred billion to trillions, that was taken out of the economy, out of other sectors, and given to the power centers. But for some strange, unusual reason, when it comes to saying, hey, let's cut out these power centers, Borofsky suddenly wants to end the phone. He had to go 
He had his 20 minutes of time with Wenzel, and that was enough. And I quote from the close to Borofsky's book. I now realize, though, that Treasury's dismissal of our warnings has produced a valuable byproduct, the widespread anger that may contain the only hope for meaningful reform of our system. I now realize that the American people should lose faith in the government. They should deplore the captured politicians and regulators who took their taxpayer dollars and distributed them to banks without insisting that they be accountable for how the bailout money was spent. Notice he's talking about accountable. So he's not really talking about people losing faith in the government because the money actually went there and was, was taken from all of us, but merely that it wasn't done in an accountable fashion. He goes on. They should be revolted by a financial system that rewards failure and protects the fortunes of those who drove the system to the point of collapse and would undoubtedly do so again. They should be enraged by the broken promises to Main Street and the unending protection of Wall Street. Because only with this appropriate and justified rage can we now sow the seeds, and this is important, he writes, for the types of reform that will one day break our system free from the corrupting grasp. The question I ask him if you've got that power center, the bad guys are going to aim at that power center. The regulation, changing the regulation doesn't matter. There's always going to be somebody that's going to have to have control if you've got the government regulation in there. And when you have the government regulation there, someone's going to get at it, so money is dispersed, regulations are made in certain ways. The problem is not getting somebody in there that's going to do it. They're going to ignore those guys. That's what Borofsky's book is completely about. He's naive to think that he is somehow going to come up with the regulation that will change the power centers from being power centers. Anyways, that's enough for my point on power centers. Okay, well, we have 10 minutes left where we plan to discuss with Neil Borofsky more about his book and what goes on in Washington. I guess that's not going to happen. Chris Rossini and I were just discussing off the air what happened to Borofsky and why this stuff goes on. And it was a pretty good back and forth discussion. So I'm going to bring Chris onto the show and just go over some of the comments that we were just making and try to get to the bottom of what happens to these guys. My question was, and this is based not just on this interview, but previous interviews. A lot of times your interview style, you pin these guys pretty hard with the truth. It's definitely something they're not used to. I can't get in their heads, but it makes me wonder what exactly their motives are. Are they just trying to protect their position in life? Because a lot of times you get them with the truth and they don't want to agree with you. They'll either hang up, say they have to go. Maybe privately they would. Maybe they would say, you know, Robert, that's a great point. We would be better off without the Treasury. But they won't say it publicly on a radio show. It just makes me wonder what goes through their head at that time. So that's the only point I had to make. Yeah, Chris, I think that's an interesting observation. After spending a lot of time in Washington, I think there are a couple of different kinds of personalities. I think there are some people who know exactly what the game is. They don't care. They're in there to make good for themselves, and that's it. And no matter who they have to trample on, they will. Others, I think, put up a blind or a block. There's denial on what's going on. I mean... No one seriously thinks that the drug war is being won in any way. You know you can get any drug you want on any street in any major city, as I pointed out to Borofsky. The same thing with the bailouts. Borofsky's book is mostly about Geithner ignoring the suggestions he made, but you also get the sense that Borofsky understands the whole top issue is questionable. Great points. And, you know, people in our realm of Austrian economics, free market capitalism, realize that there is no way to make socialism, fascism work. There's no regulation that'll make it work. There's no set of laws that'll make it work. The power people will break the laws. They do it all the time, every day. So to think that you can reform the system is uh, just a fantasy. And I bet every interview that Borofsky does, that's what they talk about, how to reform the system. You're probably the first one that confronted him with actually abolishing a power center, and he did not want to talk about that. So uh, I think this was a very valuable interview. You know, there are certain hot buttons that they're not going to talk about because they have no way to defend it. So Borofsky figured that the only thing he could do is discuss the point and agree with it or get off the phone. 
and he chose to get off the phone. The same thing with the recent interview I had with Robert Shapiro, the revolving door economist. He got off the phone at the point that I was asking him about the money supply. Now, this guy is some kind of forecaster and advisor to the IMF, and he didn't even know what was going on with the money supply. When you pin them down to stuff that they should know or have to acknowledge that there's something wrong with the power system, that's the point when they get off the phone. Right. Thank you for listening. That's the end of this show. Be sure to check in every Sunday at 7 a.m. Eastern Time when a new show will be posted at economicpolicyjournal.com. Also, remember, check out my blog, economicpolicyjournal.com, every day. I post on the economy, I post on finance, I post on politics, and I post on liberty every day, seven days a week. That's economicpolicyjournal.com. Don't miss it. Special shout out to Chris Rossini, executive producer of The Robert Wenzel Show, and also John Daubert, head of editing and mastering. See you and talk to you next week. Bye.